The Nazi Holocaust, one of the most devastating events ever to take place in human history. Millions were killed in the genocide, yet a pantheon of musical genius somehow survived. That despite the banning of compositions by Jewish composers, the slaughter of Jewish composers in concentration camps, and the loss of musical scores even among those composers who survived. Kennesaw State University music professor Lawrence Schur has dedicated much of his musical career to highlighting suppressed and all but lost compositions and tragically murdered, forgotten, and exiled composers. Five of them are featured in his concert called Songs Not Silenced, Music Forbidden in the Holocaust. The concert was recorded at KSU and features the work of the composers who were banned in Nazi Germany and occupied European countries. The ban affected Jewish composers as well as non-Jewish composers writing in modern or jazz-influenced styles. They were all denied performance, publication, and recording opportunities, bringing an end to their European careers. On this special presentation, we present some of these riveting pieces. The performances of the songs of these composers gives voice to music that was forbidden and reminds us all of the importance of tolerance, respect, and understanding in our contemporary world. A special presentation of Songs Not Silenced, Music Forbidden in the Holocaust. I'm glad to be here with you and to share with you the songs and stories of these five composers who were forbidden during the Nazi era. My hope is that we can provide a voice for those who were suppressed or silenced and strengthen their legacy through remembrance. I would like to start by giving a general overview of the suppression of composers during the Nazi era. This will provide context for the commentary and songs to follow. During the twilight years of the Weimar Republic, the Nazi party developed strong anti-Semitic, anti-modern, and anti-international perspectives on culture and the arts. After assuming power in 1933, they asserted control over cultural life in Germany and later did the same in the countries they occupied. After they labeled disapproved artists as antarctica or degenerate, those artist career possibilities in Nazi-controlled countries came to an end. The main goals of the Reichsmusikkammer, the government chamber of music under propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels, were to eliminate Jews, foreigners, and political leftists from the music scene, and to ensure that music by such undesirables was neither performed nor broadcast. The, Reich Musik, the Reichsmusikkammer blacklisted over 100 composers, including those of Jewish background like Mahler and Schoenberg and modernists like Stravinsky. There were two main reasons the Nazis established the Kulturbund or Kubu. They did this in late 1933. One reason was for cultural segregation to keep the Jewish performers and audiences out of German concert halls. The other was for propaganda, so they could counter international criticism and show the world how well they were treating the Jews. Some historians see this establishment of a cultural ghetto as the precursor to the laser physical ghettos. But the Kubu also provided benefits for the performers and audiences. And the membership in this Jewish organization grew to 180,000. However, the restrictions kept increasing. And by 1941, all of the Kubus had been disbanded. We will soon hear about Waghalter family members who participated in the Kubu. In 1938, the Nazis organized a festival of purified German music, along with an exhibit of Antarctica music, or degenerate music. I believe the source of this propaganda poster is the score of an opera by the Austrian Catholic composer Ernst Krenick. This work was forbidden because of the African-American character and references to jazz. 
As you can see in the exhibit poster, the African-American musician becomes a monkey. The carnation becomes a Jewish star. And the white shirt and background become red, possibly designating the Bolsheviks. So with one poster, the Nazis were able to denigrate multiple groups they disfavored. The seven sections in the exhibit included one on Kurt Weill, as the Nazis especially detested the enormous success enjoyed by his jazz-influenced and bawdy three-penny opera. There is an anecdote that the vile listening station at the exhibit had to be closed down because there was such a line of people who wanted to go and listen and who were enjoying Weill's music. The Nazis also recast music history and changed works they considered tainted. For example, Mendelssohn was discredited because of his Jewish ancestry. This was not an easy task as he was already recognized internationally as a great composer and conductor. However, Mendelssohn's works were forbidden and public performances halted. In 1936, his statue in Leipzig was dismantled and contemporary German musicologists rewrote music history to downplay his importance. The Nazi policies of forbidding co composers led many to leave. This dealt a severe blow to European cultural and intellectual life, especially in Germany and Austria. The historical impact was a large-scale shift of musical talent from Europe to America, as these and many other important musical figures arrived on our shores. One of the composers who escaped was Ignaz Waghalter, and we have the great privilege of having his grandson here to tell us about Waghalter's work. I would like to invite David Waghalter Green to the stage now to tell us about his grandfather. He had a very difficult time. He had gone through the experience of fascism, of persecution, and he chose to found what was to be the first African-American symphony orchestra in the United States. It was then called, using the, the terminology of the time, the American Negro Orchestra. He founded this orchestra. He went to Harlem. He recruited uh, musicians, convincing them how important it would be to become expert in classical music. He had the support of major figures such as Duke Ellington uh, and others who understood the significance of this cultural project. And uh, he then experienced the full weight of the racism of the time. Remember, this was a period where Marian Anderson could not sing in Constitutional Hall, and Eleanor Roosevelt had to arrange specially for Marian Anderson, the great contalto, to sing before the Lincoln Memorial. Well, my, my grandfather didn't have the connection to Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, in the meantime, he was being threatened with eviction from his apartments if he rehearsed African-American musicians. The project only had one public performance before it had to close for lack of sufficient financial support. But my grandfather wrote for that orchestra a suite, the New World Suite, which remained unknown for 75 years until it was discovered in my house in a box and has since been recorded. But that was an immensely significant cultural achievement. And when he was asked, why he believed this was an important project, my grandfather said. He said that music is the citadel of universal democracy. It knows no race, color, or creed. He wanted to use his skill and his art and his talent to fight back against fascism, against reaction, against all that was barbaric. And this was how he fought. Thank you. 
David mentioned to me a number of times the impact that his grandfather had even when he came to this country, and I'm sure he, he told you about the founding of this African American symphony when he came. And when he was interviewed by the Baltimore newspaper, African American newspaper in Baltimore, this quote that you see here is what he said. We're very fortunate to be part of the renaissance of Bughalter's music. And to help us celebrate that renaissance, 
we're going to welcome back to the stage Jana Young and Judy Cole to give the U.S. premiere of three songs by Ignaz Boghalter.
special presentation of Songs Not Silenced, Music Forbidden in the Holocaust.
Hände, denn alles wird gut, denn alles wird gut, er trage nur dich das Worten, vertraue der Sonko, der Lehrer. Für dich strahlt die Sonne, für dich brennt der Baum. Du hast wieder Heimat und Brüde. Das Böse vergeht wie ein schwerer Traum. Das Leben beseelig dich wieder, denn alles dir gut, denn alles Du bist betrunken. Ich sehe in deinem Schatten, an diesem tollen Schatten, der sich so toll gebärdet. Als gebe er aus dem Tollhaus ein verrückter Schatten. In allzu hellem Mondschein. Das Subjekt und das Bötzisch und so mit dem Bötzisch. Auf der und nach den Seiten ein verrückter Schatten. Welch in dies gretten Mondschein. Hab ich glauben wollen, wenn selten mit zu deiner, es wird jetzt nicht so trunken. Jetzt muss ich wahrlich glauben, ich bin ein Wirderloser. Ihm in die Strecken Mondschein. The next set of songs is by Darius Mio. The first sentence in his autobiography provides an encapsulated perspective as to his origin. Quote, I am a Frenchman from Provence and by religion a Jew, end quote. His ancestors in the south of France could be traced back 10 centuries and writers have observed his Provençal sensibilities. After moving to Paris to continue his musical studies, he encountered a wide range of musical and literary figures, including Debussy, Jean Cocteau, Schoenberg, many others. The young Parisian composers with whom he associated became known as the Group of Six. I'd like to share one story with you about the connection between Darius Mio and Kurt Weil, the other composer on our second half. 
Following the 1940 Nazi invasion of France, the Mio family packed into their car and drove to the Spanish border. On trains, they crossed Spain to Portugal. In Lisbon, their tr French transatlantic boat tickets were denied, and they didn't have enough money to purchase new tickets. Kurt Weil was among the many people that Mio contacted. They had known each other from Paris. And when the Mio's finally arrived in New York in July 1940, Kurt Weil and La Talenya were at the dock waiting to meet them. Upon arriving in America, Mio assumed a teaching position at Mills College. He held that for more than 30 years, and for 20 of those years, he also taught at the Aspen Festival. He mentored many young composers, ranging from jazz composer and pianist Dave Brubeck, to Peter Shickley of PDQ Bach fame, to microtonalist Ben Johnston, my teacher. Mio was an incredibly facile composer, and even with his teaching engagements, he composed over 400 works during his career. Mio's Jewish heritage was inspirational for a number of his pieces, and we're going to hear an early example tonight. His Jewish poems were completed in 1916, and please note this correction to the date that's printed in your program booklet. The lyrics are anonymous Jewish poetry he had seen in a magazine. The songs utilize his explorations into polytonality and help give the work its unique quality. Please welcome Jana Young and Judy Cole back to the stage for Mio's Poem Juif.
was born at the beginning of the last century and started his musical studies with his father, a cantor and liturgical composer. He moved to Berlin to study music and sub subsequently encountered two people who would figure quite prominently in his life. The first was the playwright Bertolt Brecht, with whom he had a number of collaborations during those early years in Berlin. The second was the dancer and actress Lotta Lenya, whom he married in 1926 and then remarried 10 years later in America. In Berlin, Wahl encountered the newest artistic trends, including musical modernism, jazz, cabaret, the new objectivity, and the social activism of the November group. There were two particular Brecht collaborations that brought broad recognition. The first was Mahagoni, a songspiel later expanded to an opera. In this photo, Lata Lenya is at the right of the ring holding a vial sign over the head of Bertolt Brecht. The other collaboration was the Three Penny Opera. This unconventional production took the continent by storm, and by the time Wahl had departed Germany, less than five years later, it had received more than 10,000 European performances, with productions as far afield as the US and Israel. Following the overture, the production starts with what is perhaps the best known song of Weil, the Ballad of Mac the Knife. A street singer informs the audience of the notorious deeds of the anti-hero McHeath, Mac the Knife. We will conclude our program with this famous Weil Brecht song. There were many reasons the Nazis disapproved of Weil his music's modernism and use of jazz elements, his Jewish ancestry, his association with Brecht, and his leftist leanings. Political commentary in Weil's productions did not help. One example occurs in The Ballad of Caesar's Death, a dinner entertainment song in the play. The lyrics, 
you can see an excerpt here and look at all the lyrics in your program booklets, describe the increasing tyranny of Caesar and his death as his just reward. Nazi supporters disrupted the three concurrent German premieres in February 1933, just a few weeks after Hitler was named chancellor. All productions were halted by early March, and Weil fled Germany soon thereafter. We will start our Weil set with this song. After arriving in the U.S. in 1935, Weil collaborated with leading Broadway writers and lyricists for many successes. He worked with Maxwell Anderson for the 1938 musical comedy, Knickerbocker Holiday. In September song, the next to last item on our program, the aging Stuyvesant seeks to convince the young Tina not to delay their arranged marriage. I think it is also important to recognize the significance of Viles musical contribution to two large-scale pageants that sought to bring the world's attention to the plight of the Jews during the persecution and genocide of the Nazi era. In The Eternal Road, Weil drew on the cantorial styles he had learned from his father. The show, focus, the show focused on a Jewish congregation forced to leave their homeland and had a run of over 150 performances. We Will Never Die had a mammoth 1943 production in Madison Square Garden. There was an audience of over 40,000, and the production traveled to five other cities. Another lesser-known aspect of Viles' contribution was his commitment to supporting U.S. efforts in World War II. One example is the song Schickelgruber. Lyricist Howard Dietz took some historical liberties, and even so, the pointed criticism of Hitler needs no interpretation like in Caesar's death. Weil adds to the mockery by having the singer purposefully mispronounce Hitler's ancestral name as Schickel Gruber rather than Schickel Gruber. The Holocaust was a tragic catastrophe in human history, and we are aware of the incredible loss of that time including six million Jews and five million others, all systematically murdered simply because of their religion, race, ethnic group, or beliefs. In this context, both the lives and the music of forbidden composers speak to their resilience, of the will to survive despite adversity, and ultimately of the triumph of creativity and the human spirit. This is reflected in our concert ending with upbeat music. All five composers on the program tonight were of Jewish ancestry, and they all endured oppression and great disruption of their lives and music. They all used their artistic gifts to create works that variously bore witness condemned the forces of oppression and genocide, or remembered the victims. In our concert, we indeed remember these creators and their contributions, and give voice to the songs not silenced. Like them, I hope we can oppose the forces of oppression, hatred, intolerance, and bigotry. Instead, we can strive for societies that are more just, inclusive, respectful, and understanding. This is their legacy and our choice. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share the music and story of, stories of these forbidden composers, and I ask you to please welcome our performers for our final set. Der hat Sehne und die trägt er im Gesicht. 
Yeah. 